uh, Professor Corrales uh, is um, a professor of political science at Amherst uh, College. Uh, he was a uh, visiting <coughs> scholar at David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies at Harvard, fellow at the Center for Latin American Research at the University of Amsterdam, and has been a Fulbright scholar in Caracas. So he um, deeply knows his subject. So thank you so much for coming up this evening, Javier, and uh, let thank me hand over. Much. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to start by thanking you for the invitation and for being here. Uh, um, I, uh, I feel that, you know, I am in an area of study that doesn't get a lot of attention in general. So the fact that there are people who voluntarily want to spend a little bit of their Friday evening here, hearing me talk about my research and, and this particular event is very gratifying. So thank you very much. Um, so here's the title uh, of my talk, Semi-Authoritarianism and Participatory Cancer in Venezuela. Um, I, I, I don't want to be disrespectful, but I want to talk about uh, uh, how cancer or the president's cancer um, is uh, affecting politics in Venezuela. What I want to do, I would like to spend maybe 30, 35 minutes, maximum 40. If I go beyond 40, please stop me, throw tomatoes at me. Uh, I want to go through some slides. I, I, they're not very word or data heavy, um, but I want to uh, go through them and then we can have a, a conversation where you can um, um, ask me questions or make comments or challenge me or uh, make me think about points that I left unstated. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to try to imagine that we don't know much about Venezuela. And what I'm going to try to do is in 30 minutes give you what I think are the most important pieces of the puzzle if you're trying to uh, uh, get a grip on what is going on in this country. And these are going to be my five themes that I'm going to develop. Um, and I'm going to go in order and then I'm going to have at the end a set of conclusions uh, uh, related to what I'm expecting politically. Although, although I am not a futurologist, uh, 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 I will say something about it. So the first thing I want to discuss is the notion that Venezuela is a petrostate. Um, let me just begin by saying this. If I were to ask you guys, what are some of the most powerful economies in the world? You know, I'm sure we would agree with the following list. We would start with our country, the United States. We would then do China. Then we would talk about the European Union or what's left of it. Um, we might include the BRICS, the uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China. Uh, and that would be it. I think this, this is it, right? Well, let me show you what the world looks like from the angle of a petrostate. Um, notice. These are the countries in the world that um, uh, they're drawn according to their levels of reserves in oil. So the bigger, that's the highest levels of reserves. And uh, what I want you to notice is that none of the countries that we mention, our regions, are, are big. Uh, the United States is tiny. Uh, even Brazil is tiny. The European Union is almost impossible to find. And China is uh, equally small. Uh, uh, instead, this is in many ways the view from a petrostate. This is, this is a completely different map that we're used to. And these nations feel that they have quite a bit of power, precisely because they control this commodity. What I want you to notice is, you know, the immensity of Saudi Arabia and why our relationship with Saudi Arabia is this huge and tiny Kuwait, how it becomes enormous based on its levels of research. Now, this is the amazing Middle East. And one of the reasons why we rightly focus our attention on the Middle East. But in Latin America, there is only one mega petrostate, which is Venezuela. Uh, Brazil is becoming one, so this is a little outdated, but it's not quite there yet. And let me say a little bit more about uh, uh, this notion of being a petrostate, because Venezuela's reserves have actually expanded since that map has, uh, was drawn. Uh, uh, I want you to take a look at this chart, which shows proven oil reserves in 2006, and this is in 2011. And here's Canada, Venezuela, the United States, Mexico, and Brazil, same countries, 2006. Venezuela had what was considered 80 uh, uh, billion barrels in, uh, in its, uh, uh, on, on the ground. 
Uh, and this was considered pretty major. This is the figure that was done to produce that other map. Uh, this is Venezuela today um, because they have made these, um, uh, they have, there is an area of Venezuela that contains a type of oil that now is technologically as well as economically possible to exploit. And that is such a large reserve, it's the Orinoco Reserve, that now Venezuela is probably as big as Saudi Arabia, if we were to, I need to redraw that map, in terms of just the reserves. Now, that doesn't mean that that oil is right there. It is uh, uh, um, quite a challenge to get it out, but Venezuela keeps feeling bigger and bigger and bigger. And, uh, and geologists agree. So um, the other thing that we should mention is that this is a petrostate that also sells most of its oil to the United States. Here is um, where um, U.S. oil imports come from. Uh, not oil imports, the entire, imp the entire oil demand from the United States is satisfied with 41% locally derived. And then you get our oil trading partners. And um, our first trading partner is Canada with 9%, Saudi Arabia, and Venezuela comes next. One year it's 9%, another year is 8%. Uh, we don't depend a lot on Venezuela, but in fact we don't depend a lot on anyone, but among the ones that we get most of our oil from is Venezuela. And it's very important to understand this because, related to the next point, most, Venezuela is probably the one country in this list that has the most anti-American foreign policy of all. This is the new aberration, and this is my next point. The, uh, 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 the second uh, uh, piece of the puzzle to understand about Venezuela is its, it's, it's anti-imperialism. Now, um, Latin America has a proud, long tradition of radical leftism, anti-imperialism, and Chavez is it. He is the one who claims to be currently in so many ways the heirs to uh, the Cuban Revolution, anti-Americanism, anti-imperialism. I don't want to spend a lot of time uh, uh, discussing where it comes from or what does it do, but it's important to understand that Venezuela has a systematic foreign policy of blocking whatever foreign policy initiative the United States might have. In some cases it succeeds, in many other cases uh, it does not, but it is dedicated to balancing the United States. And one of the things that Venezuela has done is to befriend explicit enemies of the United States almost for no reason other than just to be the bad boy. Um, I mean, most people say there is no real need for uh, 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 Chavez to be giving uh, honorary degrees and medals to these folks. They're not the most important oil producers. Um, um, but he, there is an explicit argument of the enemy of my enemy will be my friend. And uh, this, of course, creates the essential paradox on U.S.-Venezuela relations, which is, on the one hand, we have this <clears throat> with this. Have you heard the term friend-enemy? <laughs> uh, um, when the United States was about to go to war, to war in Iraq, Chavez in Venezuela was saying, against imperialism, that would be the most horrible thing, you know, genocide is going to start, we have to contain the Americans. And then Chavez was telling the Americans, don't worry, I'm going to sell you all the oil that, all the oil that you need. <laughs> this was true. Venezuela has never, never interrupted its oil uh, uh, flows into the United States. And we're not used to dealing with this. We're not used to enemies that are this ambiguous. Politically, definitely unfriendly to the United States. But economically, they're saving in many ways uh, our economy by providing very affordable uh, oil to us. Um, now, what is so interesting is that we find it paradoxical and even a major complication for foreign policy, but in Venezuela, this doesn't create any type of uh, self-doubt. Uh, you know, Venezuelans feel, the government feels that they are really um, examples of an incredibly independent foreign policy. They call it their second independence. 
And uh, the truth of the matter is that a political scientist would, of course, doubt the notion that there is independence, but uh, some might even say Venezuela is now more dependent on the United States, in part because they give so much oil away that the United States remains the one that pays the most. So they now need U.S. markets more than they did uh, uh, 10 years ago. But uh, this is the situation. And in many ways, it produces what, you know, let's go back to this friend-enemy analogy. You may want to think in a more uh, technical terms of a mid-level security, uh, security threat. And in foreign policy, we tend to focus on real threatening regimes that pose a serious immediate danger. And, you know, nations that we could not even spend too much time thinking about. Well, Venezuela is in this intermediate point where uh, they are siding with our enemies, but they are also giving us a lot of oil. And um, there's not a lot of theory in my field discussing how nations deal with this degree of mid-level security threat. And it's producing a lot of nervousness in Washington because, uh, think about it, we want to punish Venezuela and not punish Venezuela, right? Because uh, uh, what if they get so angry at us that they might not sell us oil? Then we're like, ooh, scary. So, so it produces, even, even the conservatives in Washington are self-restrained uh, when it comes to Venezuela. They'll talk, 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 but in the end, they don't do that much, kind of like Venezuela. They talk, talk, talk anti-Americanism, but in the end, they haven't punished us with their biggest weapon at their disposal, which would be to not sell us their oil. And that's not happening, although uh, definitely Chavez wants to. So here's the anti-Americanism. And now let me spend a few more times discussing the third theme that we all should uh, be mindful of when discussing Venezuela. This theme is perhaps the most controversial of all themes among scholars of Latin American politics. Because not everybody agrees with the characterization I am going to make of the domestic regime, the type of politics in Venezuela. Uh, there are some folks, my argument is going to be we have here also an interesting case of what can be classified as semi-authoritarianism. I give you mid-level security threat, now I'm going to give you an intermediate case between democracy and autocracy. Some colleagues of mine will say, nonsense, this is still a democracy. Other colleagues will say, nonsense, this is already a dictatorship. So all positions uh, are taken. And my position is going to be, let's think about what this country has become in terms of being a semi-autocracy. Now, here's uh, um, a little bit of uh, historical, let me give you a little bit of, of the definition of uh, uh, a semi-autocracy. A semi-autocracy, for the most part, is a country that extends significant liberties to citizens. There are freedoms that are much, much larger than you would expect in a real dictatorship. And you even have competitive elections. But the president of the country concentrates so much power in the executive branch. And what that means, what that means is that the concept that is so central to democracy, or at least to US democracy, the separation of powers, the notion of checks and balances, the limits on majority rule, which is the essence of the 1789 Constitution of the United States. The idea is, you know, once we elect a president with majorities, how do we limit the power of the president? This notion begins to be eroded to the point where there are no checks and balances on the authority of the president. But all these freedoms exist politically, and that is why uh, there is now this term of semi autocracy. Now, historically, let me show you this chart from The Economist. Um, if we go back to the Cold War, uh, the world was divided into a few democracies in terms of numbers and a great number of clear cut dictatorships, authoritarian regimes. And uh, we would make classifications of here's a dictatorship, here's a democracy. And it was mostly some, of, some democracies and some autocracies. Well, one of the things that has happened is that this is a measurement of degrees of political freedoms done by um, Freedom House. And they classify countries in terms of mostly free democracies, not free 
autocracies, and then they have the category of partially free. They, in trying to assess regimes, they have this category of partially free, which resonates exactly with what my thinking is when I use the term semi-authoritarianism. And what they find is that, you know, if you go to 1972, the majority of cases were either free democracies or not free autocracies. And the great, great news of our lifetime is that democracy, that the cases of autocracy have completely declined to a very low level. This is where they are now, not free, from being up there at the very top. Awesome news. But the problem is that we have had the rise of the number of what are in the partly free, or that right now we have to deal with this category, which is, in many ways, in many ways, it's kind of like the new trend. Uh, uh, there, deviations from democracy don't manifest themselves in your traditional military junta, sultanistic autocracies, but things more akin to what I'm going to discuss in Venezuela. And my argument is Venezuela is a very good example of this hybridity, this semi-autocracy. And let me just tell you uh, 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 how this all began. This all began with an effort to have there was a democracy in Venezuela with many problems. You know, we could spend the whole year talking about all the problems and we wouldn't be done. We could do the same of every democracy. We can go on and on and on and become high, high, highly critical. And Chavez comes to office with a notion of redo the democratic system so that we can have participatory democracy. Nobody knew that very well what that meant, but the idea was that the old politicians, the old political parties, needed to be less involved in governance. And people loved that discourse because there was an incredibly strong anti-status quo sentiment. And when he came to office with that discourse, he won big and he spent his first two years in office creating a constitution and he was calling this participatory democracy. And the new constitution does all that a constitution can to ensure that the traditional parties have less, fewer resources. And he did this. And the promise was to allow folks who had never participated to be able to participate. And there were many policies in this direction. I'm not going to discuss them, but I just want to say that in my, there is a lot that can be said on how Venezuela tried to create programs for the poor or for non-traditional politicians that mobilized Venezuelans who had not been major participants or winners in the economic political system. So that is true. But what has also occurred is that this has created an electoral coalition that has allowed Chavez to simultaneously erode the institutions of checks and balances. And this is some examples of, of uh, uh, first, um, well, skip this one. This is the, the most word-heavy uh, slide. Um, and I don't want to discuss all the items, but perhaps give you a few examples of this notion of concentration of power. Political scientists discuss power in terms of um, how the state is made accountable. And there are ways of making the state accountable horizontally, which is the notion of separation of powers across the branches of government the judiciary checking the legislature, the legislature checking the executive branch, uh, the bureaucracy being supervised by different entities, uh, the federal government and the uh, 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 state level governments. You know, we design a system of enormous um, horizontal checks in the United States and most democracies in the world imitate that. By 2005, in Venezuela, the judiciary, the armed forces, the electoral authorities, the folks who run elections, um, the most important state-owned enterprise, the central bank, and the national assembly became populated, dominated by partisan folks, members of the ruling party, uh, rather than independent civilians. And so you have a state where the Supreme Court is staffed with mostly revolutionaries, members of the ruling party. Uh, the armed forces have been purged and people have been promoted on the basis of loyalty to the a ruling party. Uh, the electoral body is also partisan. Um, and this is very important. The oil company is 
completely staffed with uh, folks that are members of the ruling party and the president basically treats the oil company like his own checking account uh, which is essentially a way of saying there are no rules that determine once all this money comes in um, what is the proper allocation of those resources well in Venezuela the proper allocation of those resources is determined by Hugo Chavez it's not determined by a debate in Congress It's not determined by a system of laws and procedures that you may want to have so this is absolutely a degree of political power unimaginable it's almost unimaginable in a real functioning democracy by definition but in Venezuela, because you have eroded horizontal accountability so much, it is fairly large. And because it is a petrostate, you add to the fact that the executive branch is also in many ways the key monopolizer, you have an actor in politics that is almost impossible to defeat once you have this accumulation of institutional resources. <laughs> Vertical accountability is the accountability that we establish in society. How do we as citizens try to hold our elected officials accountable? And there are many problems there, but I don't want to bore you with the details. I just want you to understand that, yes, you have freedoms, and yes, you have elections, but you have the complete disappearance of the notion of checks and balances in Venezuela and that this is a violation of some of the liberal definitions of democracy. Now, to add insult to injury, Venezuela approved in 2009 the end of term limits. Um, term limits was a notion that we in the United States didn't develop when we created our constitution. It is, however, a notion that has become very prevalent now. We also now have it in our constitution in the United States. It is a Latin American invention, the notion of term limits in the 19th century. In Latin America in the 19th century, they discovered that one of the major problems they were having with freedoms was that a big military guy would come to office, sometimes legitimately, but once in office will wield all forms of power and convert himself into an undefeatable ruler. And to deal with this problem of what is called the incumbent's advantage, that once you're in office, you control so many resources that over time, by staffing just the bureaucracy alone, you gain so much traction, Latin Americans invented the notion is, we're sorry, after a term, you have to leave. In other words, we are going to supersede the right of the majority, who might have elected you, and impose a restriction in the choice of people precisely to save us from the incumbent's advantage. And this is very Latin American. It started in Argentina in uh, the 19th century. It became very important in Mexico, and it spread even to the United States. Well, in Venezuela, they had it. They had uh, term limits, and there was a referendum where the president um, uh, proposed eliminating term limits, and he won. And this is a major game changer in Venezuelan politics, because what this does is that when every member of the ruling party knows that the president can always run, you essentially disable, discontinue the internal debates about succession, which is always very important in democratic renewal, is to begin to think as to who's going to come next. But in Venezuela, after this law was approved, the ruling party stopped discussing the notion of succession until the president said he had cancer. And that is my next point. Oh, before I get to my next point, just to give you an idea of this notion of the judiciary collaborating with the executive branch, uh, here's a picture of uh, Dr. Luisa Estela Morales, who is the president of the constitutional uh, wing of the Supreme Court, the, Supreme, the wing of the Supreme Court that handles constitutional affairs. And she was quoted publicly in a speech that's long saying, we cannot continue to think about separation of powers because that is a principle that weakens the state. The notion is the following. This is the, the philosophy. 
this is a government of the people, of the majorities. Therefore, to have limits on what the majority wants is undemocratic. We think that to have limits on the majority is the most democratic thing we want to be because who knows when it is that we're going to be in the opposition, we're going to be in a minority. So we created a system of ensuring that our majorities face huge checks and balances. But in Venezuela, the notion is because we are the people, nobody should be imposing these limits. And when you have one of the highest officials making this statement, she's a revolutionary, she's very much affiliated with the government, um, uh, you have to get a pretty good idea that they are moving in a direction that does not look like anything that we know of, at least based on uh, an 18th century vision of democracy from what we have. All right, so UN term limits, and then the president um, in 2011 reveals that, that he has cancer. This was treated like in the very beginning, like a huge state secret. Uh, there were rumors of him disappearing to Cuba to get medical treatments. They were denying it. They didn't want to talk about it. And then one day, the news was uh, revealed uh, uh, that uh, Hugo Chavez has cancer. Nobody knows what kind of cancer. Nobody knows how serious the cancer is. Nobody knows what kind of medical treatment he is taking. He says it's chemo. And, he, and we know that he takes his treatments in Cuba. He has been to Cuba, I understand, four times to get treatment. Uh, publicly, that, that's that much we know. And this is, you know, Hugo Chavez right before the announcement that he had cancer. And this is a picture of Hugo Chavez from um, uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. All right, so one of the things that everybody's talking about in Washington is, does this guy, is this guy dying? What is the problem? And they ask me, and I'm like, I don't know, you know, this is like, you know, they're pretty good at keeping secrets, I don't know, but, you know, um, he is fatter, he's swollen, um, but to me this doesn't look like this is a person who is facing the last stages of cancer. Um, there is the belief that this look, this new look, is the result of steroids, probably not the result of chemo, but at the same time, it doesn't seem like um, he, he is on the last leg. Um, he's recovered some strength, and now he is uh, becoming a little bit more involved. But this is what the government has done with the notion of cancer. How old is he? 54. No, no. He's very young. No, okay. Very young. Um, what started out as a state secret has become a new political move on the part of the government. Um, the government, despite being a socialist, Marxist, Leninist government, began to organize prayer sessions uh, for the president. Uh, began to talk all the time, almost like, how, has anybody been to Cuba or traveled to Cuba? When you go to Cuba, it's, um, you've been to Cuba? I don't know if you noticed this, but when you go to Cuba, there are no, there's no private retail, right? All the retail is state-owned. So the billboards are all state-owned and they're all political slogans. And it's very inspiring. You're, you go through these billboards and they're all, they have messages like, we will triumph. Nobody is going to be able to defeat us. Uh, you know, let's keep on marching uh, hasta la victoria. And so you read these things and they're very like, Ugh. well, Chavez has adopted the same discourse of I'm going to beat this. I'm going to beat this. I am better than ever. I am a new man. Uh, my cancer is gone. I'm having a newborn experience. Um, and um, my point is that uh, now, rather than discussing the notion of participatory democracy, it seems that we have moved into the area of participatory cancer because we need to be discussing all the time either how soon the president is going to die, if you are interested in that question, or how hopeful we are that this president is getting better and better by the minute. It has become now a campaign tool. 
This is an important development uh, for a number of reasons. Let me just give you an example of participatory cancer. <laughs> So he, Chavez, goes to the Dominican Republic and one of his uh, uh, visits with his, he goes and he uh, uh, gives a lot of subsidies. And then he's received by these friends of Venezuelans, they're Dominicans, and what do they do? They have a ceremony and they all shave their hair, their hair off in solidarity with the president, <laughs> right? So, you know, you're definitely doing participatory cancer. This is as, as political as it can be. And um, this is now happening in other countries, but it's happening a lot in Venezuela. And um, it is undoubtedly an electoral strategy. Um, um, there's going to be an election. And let me say something about this election and then before I do this, let me, let me uh, discuss this little, little graph. Between 2004 and approximately 2008, <clears throat> Chavez was very comfortable, electorally speaking. He would have a number of elections, almost one every year, for a number of topics, and his ruling party would win. There were allegations about fraud or irregularities, but on election day, there wasn't that much fraud. One could say that the fraud occurred in preparing the country for the elections in the way that the state spends money and the way that politicians who are not members of the ruling party get to compete. But I don't think that his victories were fabricated up until 2007. But what has happened in Venezuela, this is, this is uh, directly taken from one of the best pollsters in Venezuela about, uh, uh, they, they ask a number of questions. What do you think of the president? Do you think he's doing a good job? Um, uh, four or five questions of that sort that are designed to try to get an idea of the overall popularity of the president and they combine them into this index. And what this index shows is that from a high point in 2005 to the third quarter of 2001, there is a decline in the electoral, com in the popularity of the president and consequently in the electoral competitiveness of the president. Uh, one could say that up until 2008, he was still fairly comfortable with numbers above the 50 uh, 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 horizontal line. But since then, this is what has been happening. And there is no question that this notion of moving into a participatory cancer is one way to at least generate some sympathy votes from those who have defected, since there seems to have been a process of defection. And right now, right now, we don't know whether the strategy is working or not, right? Participatory cancer has only been with us for three months, and we don't know, we don't know whether it is doing the trick, whether it is producing a reversal. But what we do know, and this is what I can discuss as a political scientist, not the cancer, because I'm not an MD, um, for the first time in Venezuela, there's going to be an electoral process where the government is going to sweat where you have a president who does not know whether he is going to be able to win. And this is a source of nervousness because we used to believe that the reason that this regime never went all the way autocratic and allowed for many freedoms to survive was because at the end of the day, he can win an election, but not anymore. And so what is, going to become, what is going to happen here? Are we going to see a tightening of the political system, an effort of desperate uh, 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 proportions to try to now begin to tighten the political leash in the country? Or are we going to see what you should observe in a democratic period, you know, after 12 years, 12 years in office with all kinds of problems, um, you know, a number of criticisms at this time for some rotation in, in office? This is the first time that uh, there is this possibility in Venezuela. Now, why would this make folks nervous? Let me just say uh, uh, where the nervousness is. There are two sectors that are very nervous, very, very nervous. One is Washington, D.C., and I'll say something about this. But before I say Washington, I want to discuss the other group, um, the president's allies, um, the members of the ruling party. The members of the ruling party know that 
when Chavez was healthy, strong, active, present, he was a major political force that was undefeatable. Now they're wondering. Now they're wondering whether, even if with Chavez stays with us, can he win? It doesn't seem like uh, he can. And if, worse, if the worst scenario happens, which is he becomes so sick that he definitely has to withdraw temporarily, uh, who's going to replace him? So for the first time in Venezuela, there is the discussion of succession. And Chavez cannot deal with this situation at all. He has never faced the possibility of internal dissent. So he repeats over and over again, just say uh, this phrase. Is it in English? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't get to translate it. Uh, it's from August 2011. And what he's saying is, I had already said that I was going to leave office in, 220, in 2021. Well, you know what? I am, uh, uh, I'm not leaving in 2021 or ever. Uh, maybe in 2031. I don't know. Maybe when I turn 77. What he's doing there is talking to his party. This is right after the announcement of his cancer. And what he's saying is, don't count me out. Um, this is a message mostly to his party because there is, for the first time, a bit of turmoil. For the first time, the Chavistas are like, well, you know, maybe it should be me who's next. And somebody's saying, oh, you don't seem to be the better Chavista of us, so maybe it should be me. And so there's going to be the possibility of a little bit of a storm happening within the ruling party. And now let me say something about uh, Washington. Oh, here's another sign of the decline in electoral competitiveness. These are Venezuela's elections from 2004 to the last one that took place in 2010 for all kinds of uh, uh, um, uh, issues. This was a recall referendum. This was a general election for the presidency. This was a, a referendum to change the constitution, a, an election for regional, uh, like governors and majors, um, uh, mayors, excuse me. And um, this is a, uh, the referendum to change the term limits and this was a parliamentary election. Now, uh, it shows the Chavez vote and the combined votes of the opposition. And what I want you to notice is that this was the peak in Chavez's popularity. And he was able to make an interesting comeback here in 2009. But the other story is that the opposition to Chavez is definitely on an upward trend. This is all part of the erosion of the competitiveness. So, so the opposition is not nervous like the ruling party is. The opposition is feeling like we've never been better and things are going uh, 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 our way. So it's not the opposition that is freaking out. It's, and, uh, uh, it is in many ways the ruling party and then um, the situation in uh, Washington. Let me just uh, discuss that for a moment by making a brief analogy to um, uh, the Arab Springs um, uh, that we have been witnessing. Um, one of the things that we observe in the case of Egypt, especially, where you also had an electoral autocracy of sorts, is that there was an electoral process coming up in 2010 where the government, where Mubarak felt very nervous, just like Chavez. He was no longer confident that he was going to have the ample majorities. So he tightens the reins of power significantly and begins to impose more and more restrictions on the opposition. And in many ways, this trigger unrest. This is a possible scenario in Venezuela. If we observe the government now getting so nervous that they begin to tighten screws, it could very well be that the opposition, which is feeling like um, this is my year, they might be in conditions to protest big time. The other impact, the other lesson from the Arab Springs is that we now know that the key factor in determining whether these uh, uh, forms of unrest led to a change in regime was the behavior of the military where the military abandons the ruling party, you do see a transition. Where the military sides with the ruling party, you see repression, and that's the end of the story. And in situations like Libya, where the, ruling, where the military splits, you see a protracted war. 
And the nervous, the, the reason why uh, folks in Washington are nervous is because we don't know how the military is going to respond. And people are fearful that the ruling party might respond by tightening the political system and thus unleashing a little bit of uh, instability. Why is instability in Venezuela a big problem? And I'll tell you why it is a big problem. It's not just because we're going to lose the oil that we get, although that's a major problem. The important thing is because we have had a policy toward Venezuela that will be a policy towards Venezuela that I think has been enormously successful and worth preserving, but a policy that will be seriously jeopardized if we get political instability in Venezuela. This policy is we're not going to criticize you that much. We're not going to engage in a war on words. You're going to say all that you want, and we're not even going to mention your name. We're going to pretend that you don't exist. And this has been an incredibly effective strategy because it has avoided converting the issue in Venezuela into a David versus Goliath, which is what uh, Chavez wants. So the United States has a policy of, if you keep sending us the oil, we will just sanction softly, mention you almost in passing, and be done with that. But if there's instability in Venezuela, the United States government is going to have to side with either the government or the opposition. And the problem is that here you're going to have a very popular government that is very anti-American, that can use the electoral uh, 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 unrest to get the United States to fall into the trap of, in the interest of uh, supporting an opposition or, or condemning uh, electoral irregularities, the United States could decidedly side with the opposition and this could strengthen the government because the government would then have the fight with the United States that it um, so much desires. Um, there is won't be, uh, like we saw with now Syria and uh, before with Libya, Latin Americans taking the side of the opposition. That we won't see even if there is unrest. So the United States is not going to be able to act alone, excuse me, um, act multilaterally. If for some reason we get a situation where an election is very contested, the opposition feels that the results are not uh, believable, and the United States is going to be forced to, to take a stand. So um, the conclusion is that the following. On the one hand, on the one hand, we have a regime in Venezuela we shouldn't be worrying too much about because it does what we want this regime to do, which is to send us oil. And it has a democracy, it has, it has a government that is elected by the majority, and so far it is stable. This is all we want. And that explains why even Bush decided to have some kind of uh, learn to live with Chavez. But things are very different today than there were in the past six years as a result of these factors, essentially the erosion in the comp electoral competitiveness of the ruling party and that this could generate a degree of instability that in the case of Venezuela, precisely because it's our friend enemy, we're not going to know what to do with our friend enemy if there is a disputed election. So those are my remarks and very eager to hear your responses and comments. Yes, sir. Taking cognizance of the uh, neo anti neoliberal trend in South America, you know, Ecuador, Bolivia, yes. Chile, what are the implications of that for a post Chavez Venezuela? I mean, we really couldn't guarantee that the opposition would perform the way we would want it to. Yes, um, that's um, a very complicated um, question. Um, an important pillar of Chavez's foreign policy is to provide financial and technical aid to like-minded governments in the region, uh, the members of the so-called ALBA, the Alliance, the Bolivarian Alliance uh, for the Peoples of Our America. And this includes several countries. And Chavez is the big boss here because he has the big bucks. He's the one who has the money. If Chavez 
is no longer uh, become is no longer the president, the opposition will have to face a decision as to what to do with this foreign policy. Are they going to continue to provide funds or are they going to like uh, cheat and, and be like a bad neighbor and say, you know what, I'm going to pull the plug. So um, this is a major um, um, uh, dilemma for the opposition. Now, uh, if Chavez wins, uh, then we can expect to see more of the same in terms of Chavez using oil wealth to support uh, uh, these governments that are more to the left and are uh, um, uh, somewhat anti-American, though none is as anti-American as, uh, as Chavez in Venezuela. Um, because Venezuela has these new reserves that we discussed at the beginning, um, they're saying that by the year 2013, 2014, the government is going to be able to start to feel the effects of extracting this oil. So by 2013, 2014, we are going to see whoever is in office, Chavez or the opposition, we're going to see an expansion in an oil bonanza in Venezuela. So in many ways, you just have to make it up to uh, 2013, and then you're going to be a new sort of regional oil king uh, for, for whomever is in office in Venezuela. Javi, you said in, there, is, there isn't an Arab Spring parallel here in that the United States in this case will not, is not an option of supporting the opposition. Uh, who is the opposition and what do they, and what do they want? Um, and, and if I can ask a two-parter, is, is there any, I mean, as a political scientist, is there any precedent for a, a, a leader using illness to, to, to this level of sophistication? Um, you know, I mean, for, Fidel, how, you know, it's, it's sort of pales almost by what he's doing. I, I, I'm, I'm racking my brains for example, but who is the opposition and has, has anyone pulled this stump before? The opposition today is a very different opposition than we had at the very beginning. Uh, they are, the first thing that you want to know is that in terms of numbers, it's large. But also in terms of party fragmentation, um, um, let, me, let me use this. Uh, jargon, the notion of party fragmentation. We don't have party fragmentation in the United States, but many democracies have it. Party fragmentation is the word that we use to describe how many parties are there. And you can have a two-party system, you can have a three-party system, you can have a multi-party system, but you can be like Venezuela and have like 35 parties in the opposition, and that would be an example of party fragmentation. The key challenge for the opposition has been to overcome this fragmentation to form unity. You would think it's easy because you would think that the enemy is the same and a common enemy produces a common front. But the truth of the matter is that a common enemy in politics produces divisions as to how do you deal with it? Do we participate? Do we follow this rule? Do we protest this? Do we? There's so much discussion of how you deal with this. What the opposition has done remarkably well in the last two years is to fight this, this unity. And now they have agreed to have all the parties are going to participate in one primary. They're going to merge their primaries into one. And the leading members have said that we will accept the results of the primary in order to have one candidate. And this is called the um, uh, table of unity, la mesa de la unidad. Who knows? what's going to happen after the primary is held. For now, they are just like the Republican Party, you know, being all crazy with uh, promises of what they're going to do and what they don't like about Chavez. And, um, but there's going to be a major moment in February when there's going to be a primary. And we need to observe whether this fragmentation issue is going to be solved. The second issue with the opposition is abstentionism. In an electoral democracy, a typical response of citizens, not just in a, in a in an electoral autocracy, but also in an electoral democracy, you get a lot of abstentionism. The notion is that you citizens feel like um, it's pointless to go on, out and vote. Um, this is more problematic if um, the, the system is seen so rigged as op opposition forces see it in Venezuela. So what the uh, opposition is doing is trying to fight abstentionism. We'll see. But it's a big thing. So now, rather than trying to get the president to be overthrown, which is what they were doing in the very beginning, now they're trying to seek unity 
and uh, defeat abstentionism. We will see. Uh, yes. Being very cynical about this, it seems highly unlikely that the ruling party is just going to roll over and say, darn it, we lost that election. Uh, I, don't, I know nothing about it, but what, you know, what do you know? In revolutionary environments, you develop a discourse of the pre-status quo situation being so objectionable that you cannot imagine yourself as a revolutionary in office handing power back to the folks you defeated. Revolutions and democracy don't go hand in hand if you think of democracy of alternation in office with your enemies. In a revolutionary situation, you warn your enemies to be completely uh, uh, out of the picture. And this is the ideology of Chavez, a good revolutionary uh, the way he is. And so he has this discourse of never again should we have non-revolutionaries governing Venezuela. So what happens if they lose? Are they going to step down? Are they going to step down and be loyal? Are they going to uh, turn into uh, uh, an armed insurrection? Are they going to be an obstructionist force? <clears throat> Are they going to just uh, wither away? We don't know. We have never observed Chavismo in opposition, so we cannot um, predict. Chavez talks about the fact that we need to defend the revolution with arms. This is a peaceful revolution, but it's a revolution that has to be defended with weapons. So who knows what's going to happen to uh, this movement if they ever move to the opposition. They're not exactly ready to be an opposition force, so we'll see. There are folks who say that below Chavez at the leadership, there are some folks who believe that they can be like the PRI in Mexico. Anybody has been to Mexico? Well, Mexico suffered the consequences of being under the rule of one party for almost 70 years. This party was voted out of office, and many people thought we buried them forever. Well, it's making a comeback, and it's probably going to win the presidential elections, this, this old party. This party in Mexico at some point decided that, you know what? We can live in the opposition and thrive, and they proved to be correct. They have thrived in the opposition. There are folks in Venezuela who think that we can kind of uh, um, survive uh, a, a short period in the opposition and then we can come back. And that would be great if that faction prevails because you need a faction in the ruling party that feels that it's not the end of their journey if they switch over to the opposition, to, if, they, if they become the opposition. Chavez is not that one, but maybe other folks are there. Um, policy and how, what it's all about. Um, it's, it's, I mean, one can argue that there's a lot of cynicism in taking Chavez's money and, or his oil and giving some lip service to him, but not really giving a lot of, of power, at least regional power. I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't influence very much in Latin America in, in terms of, of the regional, you know. And, and then you, places like Colombia, where he actually has helped uh, solidify opposition to Venezuela and strengthen the government in many ways. So that's, that's you know, it, what's his foreign policy for in kind of political science? Why, why does he do it? Domestic reasons? Because it makes him look better domestically? Oh, one more person. There was, yes, you, uh, sir, yes. Did, did I notice from one of your slides that there were a lot of the opposition that he had put in prison? Um, the decline in the popularity of the president is the result of a large number of issues that are unaddressed. Chavez wins big when the question is helping the poor. That is the issue that he owns. It's probably overstated. He doesn't deserve that much credit because uh, given the amount of money that has gone into this, the an analysis of uh, the cost-benefit or the uh, um, the return on the investment is, wouldn't be so uh, laudatory, uh, but he wins on that issue. On almost every other issue that Venezuelans now care about, crime, the decline of unemployment, the scarcity of products, inflation, which is one of the highest in the world, um, uh, urban management problems, um, um, the degree of corruption, there's very little that the government um, uh, can flaunt. So it's a regime that is politically strong, but it has many cracks. 
And this is one of the explanations. So I could go on and on and about it, but uh, uh, there is the question of on issues other than poverty, the performance is just not there, and especially the question of crime. I have to say that this is a government that has an incredibly remarkable, laissez-faire attitude toward petty crime, and, um, and this is now an issue that most Venezuelans feel is inexplicable. So, so he is hurting because um, he hasn't been able to um, um, win um, Venezuelans over with regard to issues other than um, distribution. The foreign policy, uh, you know, I mean, in many ways, it's sort of like, why does he bother with um, a grandiose foreign policy when, if you think about it, he hasn't really altered the course of world politics that much. And in many ways, he's producing backlashes. As you say correctly, in Colombia, one of the reasons why uh, the president in Colombia, um, the two presidents that we have had in the 2000s, um, uh, Uribe and now Santos are so strong is because uh, it's a backlash. They're ideological, different from Chavez, and so Colombians hate Venezuela's uh, intervention in Colombia so much that they love their president more than they should. Um, um, so, given all the all the backlash, all the problems that are the cost of this policy that doesn't seem to be bearing any fruit. Why is it? And, and you're absolutely right in trying to see whether there is a domestic politics explanation for this. And I don't want to overstate it, but I think there is the question of um, um, if, you, if you, if I may unite my answer to your question to the one that you were saying, when you as a government have very things positive to run on, and when even members of your coalition on the left are feeling like, you know, we could do better, you desperately need some alternative credential. And by having an incredibly anti-imperialist foreign policy, he calms down some of the leftists in his coalition who feel that how come we have all these other blind spots. So the, it has an effect in um, tranquilizing some of the left in Venezuela who might start to begin to defect. It has that role. Nevertheless, nevertheless, Venezuela is an incredibly pro-US country. Most polls will tell you this. The level of support for the United States is almost equivalent to uh, um, uh, Canada. Now, Canada is not, doesn't <laughs> love us that much, but Canada is not uh, um, 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 you know, a revolutionary government or even a, uh, 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 an Islamic republic. So, um, and Venezuelans, in terms of popularity, you know, they love America and they, they you know, it's kind of like Cuba. Cubans adore all things Americana, but the government is the opposite. In Venezuela, there's a little bit of that as well. Um, so there's a limit to how far we can go with an explanation for the foreign policy that is domestically driven. But that, of course, leaves the mystery of what's, uh, what's, uh, what's driving this. Let me just say one more thing about the foreign policy. In Latin America, the foreign policy of Chavez is block almost any idea, initiative that may come from the United States just for the sake of it. In some cases, rightly so. In some cases, they have been able to block things that needed to be blocked. In other cases, you're like, oh, what's the point of this? But in the world of petrostates, that map that we started the lecture with, he has a very clear policy, and that is to balance Saudi Arabia, to uh, try to build alliances with all the petrostates in the world to go against the official foreign policy of Saudi Arabia, which is to maintain an affordable and stable price of oil. What Chavez and um, uh, Iran want is to have very high oil prices and to balance Saudi Arabia without destroying uh, the uh, OPEC. That is uh, uh, an important component. One of the reasons why he is in pictures with uh, Iran's uh, president uh, Ahmadinejad is because there is an explicit effort to try to balance Saudi Arabia without, kind of like France and NATO, uh, without destroying NATO, be a counterforce to the large uh, petrostate in the club, which is Saudi Arabia. Very, that, part, that foreign policy is going not too bad. That is, and that has a, an internal logic of its own that is, uh, that I at least can articulate. Um, and, um, the, the folks in prison, um, 
Well, you know, this is a very difficult and un hard to believe count. There are, you don't have, you don't have big crackdowns where you take large number of people and send them to jail, but you have some key figures that are in many ways representative of something like a military officer or a judge or, um, or a, um, a businessman who become symbolic prisoners um, and that the government keeps in prison almost blatantly for political reasons. You know, it's sort of like, I'm not gonna do it with everyone, but I want everyone to know that this judge, for example, who challenged me, ended up in prison. Therefore, let's not have too many of them. So you have very selective and symbolic political arrests so that you're not going to see a wave of arrests. This is what you would have seen under classic autocratic regime. What you have is these very careful, um, uh, uh, even members of his own party end up uh, in prison. And it's always one or two. And I think they're there for the signaling that it does, more so than for the effort to neutralize the opposition. It's, the, the numbers aren't that high to be the explanation for an opposition that might be disabled. It's, it's a symbolic effort. There is a law in Venezuela where it's, in, in Venezuela it's illegal to protest against the government. It's illegal to um, criticize the government. Uh, it's illegal to receive foreign aid as an organization, like if we want to send money to an organization, um, that organization can get in trouble politically if it is discovered to have been receiving foreign uh, financial assistance. So it has these very draconian laws, but I don't think it is draconianly repressive yet. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you were saying that the opposition is a very, very heterogeneous group. Uh -huh. Uh, so if and when they come into power, do you have predictions about what, what issues and what direction they would want to take the country in? Let me begin by saying that I don't think they're going to win. Let me just be, uh, I don't think that they're going to come to power. I just don't, I mean, I, sh I should read. I don't think they're going to come to power. They might win, but they, yeah, um, but um, the, Um, one of the things that they're going to do is, of course, to invite a great number of foreign oil companies, private, private oil, oil companies, to come in and help them develop those new reserves. Chavez is almost about to do this, but he can't because his rhetoric doesn't allow him, but it is necessary. Um, the next thing that I think a government is going to have to do is face the problem of insecurity, of uh, uh, crime. And this could be uh, the kiss of death for the opposition. On the one hand, there is a lot of demand from the part of citizens to do something about it. But we also know from Mexico and from Colombia that when you declare a war on organized crime and you try to take on the drug dealers, you may win but not without a very long and uh, dangerous fight. Um, there is a process of enormous uh, war between the state and um, the target groups. And so this could be the end of um, uh, an opposition government. So this is perhaps the, the more complicated question that they will face. Um, there's, there's so much more, in I mean, look, when we think of petrostates, what are the images that now come to mind? Oh, Dubai and Abu Dhabi and these palaces. And you go to Caracas and you have squalor, right? You don't see any of this wealth. And there is the argument that you need to deal with the infrastructure of the country, that um, there is so much deterioration, even in the infrastructure of your oil sector, that we should see more investment in that direction. But that, of course, will mean less distribution for the poor, and so that could be complicated. Um, yes, uh, uh, and I think, it, well, sorry. Yeah. In light of the fact that some uh, decision-making authority has devolved to the community councils, how do you factor them into your conception of a semi-authoritarian state? Yes. Um, the community councils um, is one of the um, institutional innovations of the government that falls under the rubric of participatory democracy. 
And the participatory part of it is that you actually have uh, citizens who come from all walks of life that will begin to decide issues of public policy. I guess the closest thing would be a town hall meeting for us or just folks who are not traditional politicians, neighborhoods in a particular community uh, getting together to make decisions on public policy of sort. Budget, budget. Budget to some extent, uh, yes. But the problem is that they're not elected offices and certainly they're not um, um, populated by uh, non-Chavistas. So in some ways, it's one of these hybrid institutions in that you have new participants, but on the other hand, they're not elected and they do, you don't have opposition there. So you do have a mayor and you have uh, an official assembly and the question is, are these community councils bypassing the elected officials? And so it's a complicated question. Um, uh, many people find that this is where the most vibrant forms of participatory democracy are occurring in Venezuela. I can tell you that the opposition feels that this is the biggest example of exclusion. Yes. Uh, I would say that Chavez is one of the most charismatic leaders perhaps in the last decade, really, when you think about uh, heads of state. Um, and that's certainly something that's hard to overcome in, a, um, in any sort of place. Is there anyone else who has that sort of charismatic leadership that's within any of the parties, his or another one, that might be able to take that same role on? The answer is no. And in many ways, I'm glad that there is, and I'll tell you why, for now. Um, in a democracy, charisma must emerge as a result of an electoral process. Um, as a citizen campaigns on, in order to get votes, you should use that process of elections to choose the charismatic forces. So when you have charismatic leaders emerging outside of an electoral process, you've got to wonder where this charisma comes from. What has happened is, of course, the opposition hasn't had to produce a single candidate since 2006. So you don't see charismatic leaders there just yet. Many folks think that this is the most important handicap of the opposition. I think that's healthy because otherwise you would have seen an imposition type of figure, kind of like an, a Herman Cain person who came, comes in and without any electoral experience all of a sudden tries to eclipse everyone. And that's not necessarily that healthy. You want the, the, the charisma to rise in connection with the electoral process. So Chavez is a charismatic leader that emerges as a charismatic leader as a result of a lot of elections, and that's great. But the negative consequence of the end of term limits is that in many ways it dampened the possibility of charismatic leaders emerging uh, from within. So um, now that for the first time the government faces the urgent need of producing a new candidate, uh, they don't have that candidate. And, and, um, and that could be a problem. Um, uh, 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 that will produce nervousness. Uh, now, we may not need it, right? We could have something, I mean, Venezuela could turn into like a Russia, the way that Putin uh, designated Medvedev to be, you know, sort of like a, a, a non-charismatic figure, but Putin remained the charisma behind the throne. Um, and that could happen, that could occur. Um, uh, Fidel Castro and Raul Castro is very similar. Raul is not exactly charismatic, but the, the Wizard of Oz is, is still behind, and that, and that does the, 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 the work, yeah. Yes? Uh, kind of an observation and then a question. Um, as I think of, first of all, I'm a, I'm a bit embarrassed by my knowledge of um, South America as opposed to other parts of the world. And I, I, when I talk to my colleagues about issues in the world, we don't generally talk about South America. We talk about Europe or Asia or other parts of the world. And I, I'm not sure if that's true of just my circle or if it's true of Americans in general. I'm a little bit perplexed as to why Americans in general, at least my crowd, hasn't been so interested in South America or in our hemisphere. So I, what I know about it tends to be the, 
bad stuff, the drugs in Colombia and things like that, and you know the changes in Brazil. I, I got here about five minutes late, and I'm sorry, you might have said this, but the place, my question is, the place of, of, uh, of uh, Venezuela in South America, outside of its tremendous oil reserves, what, what is the importance of Venezuela in, in the hemisphere, in, in South America in general? I, I just don't have a good feel for that. Please, thank you. Um. I, I think that Americans are terrific in that they are the only uh, uh, country that in very large numbers always feels uh, embarrassed about lack of knowledge. In many countries, people are equally unknowledgeable and they don't feel bad about it. So, so I think I love that. Um, and look, I don't know anything about Africa, for example, so I have my huge knowledge gaps. We all have to focus. There's, this is called... Uh, you know, um, we all have to be rationally ignorant. We cannot become experts at everything, so you should be uh, 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 not embarrassed by it, but actually I'm uh, proud that you came. Uh, um, um, Venezuela is the, was trying in the beginning of the Chavez administration to become the new leader of a new anti-imperialist coalition with pretensions of forming some type of unity. There was even talk at some point of a common currency. As you can imagine, that's uh, 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 postponed for a later, for another generation. Um, but what has occurred is that Chavez's reputation has declined significantly. His popularity now uh, is, is not what it was even though his oil is just as high. So he doesn't enjoy this appeal. It doesn't have to use our favorite term from Joe Nye, its soft power has become too soft, too, too, like it doesn't have the magnetism that it once had. And the nation that now has all the soft power, all the capacity to attract admiration and even emulation is Brazil. So in many ways, the decline of Venezuela is a function also of the rise in uh, Brazil. Um, a great talk for another day would be to discuss the implications of the rise for Brazil and the challenge that it poses for the United States, not just Venezuela. But I want to say one thing. I am glad that we don't know a lot about Latin America because it is a sign of all the many good stories that are happening politically. We tend to focus, even political scientists, we focus on crisis, uh, complications, dangerous. This is the price, kind of like uh, doctors focus, focus on disease, right? Uh, uh, political scientists, we do this. The press, uh, we want to pay attention to this. And Latin America has receded to the foreground in part because you have there fairly well-run democracies that overcame years of authoritarianism uh, uh, overcame financial instability in the 1990s, almost to the point where they're now giving lessons to Greece and Italy on what to do with their sovereign debt. And, and for the first time ever in the 2000s, Latin America is producing impressive reductions, not just in poverty rates, but in inequality. This is something we have never seen. And so it's a lot of good news. And we shouldn't know that much about it because in many ways it's a sign of the fact that this is a region that is thankfully better off compared to all the trouble spots around the world. Um, if Venezuela is the most menacing thing that's coming from Latin America, it's not that big a deal in many ways. Uh, this is what I, t you know, uh, 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 my Venezuelan friends, either in the opposition or in government, cannot believe this. They cannot believe that they are a small deal, that they are, you know, the government. And, and the truth is that who cares? I mean, as long as this oil comes, <laughs> the one thing that the United States does worry about South America is the drug issue. That is uh, the one thing uh, uh, that is absolutely national security level. Um, because of the level of crime associated and violence, and because we do now have evidence of these mafias now penetrating U.S. institutions, um, that this is not um, uh, that easy to contain. I know that the war on drugs is enormously controversial, and I am the first one to recognize that there's no solution, but 
the new thinking is that uh, we may never, never, never eliminate the production of drugs. You know, supply is huge, demand is getting bigger, so, you know, do your econ 101 and, you know, large supply, large demand, that market is uh, impossible to disappear. But the new thinking is that you can lessen the violence associated with a trade. That's a new school of thought. I don't know whether it's possible. People use Colombia as an example of, you don't need to lower the drug trade that much. Colombia hasn't lowered the, 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 the drug ex, uh, export uh, sector. Um, but you can reduce the violence significantly. Um, but this is a very controversial area. This is, but this, there is a renewed vigor in the war on drugs, not so much because there is optimism about um, the decline in the production of drugs and the demand on drugs, but because there is the belief that you can diminish the violence associated with the drug trade. So that is the one thing that Americans worry a lot. And, um, and uh, to the point of, it, it, I think it is uh, scary to folks in Washington as uh, instability in the Middle East. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I fear that we'll exhaust you. Um, <laughs> if you want, you know, we're willing to take one more question. Um, you guys have been great. Uh, uh, um, <clears throat>